Welcome back to Biographics. I'm your host, cosmic horror madman Eric Malachite, and today's protagonist is none other than Maximinus Thrax, the barbarian emperor of Rome. Radu Alexander penned the script for this one, so be sure to give him a big thanks in the comments. As always, be sure to check my links out in the description if you like my voice and face area, and let's get to it. Nothing lasts forever. Today we remember the might of the Roman Empire, but it could not go on endlessly. When exactly the decline began is something for historians to debate. But we can argue that the empire reached its peak in the 2nd century AD, during the reigns of the five good emperors, and slowly went downhill afterward. Then, that slow decline fell off a cliff 50 years later when the end of the Severan dynasty brought about a long period of great instability and weakness known as the Crisis of the 3rd Century. And this upheaval was triggered by the violent and murderous reign of a giant of a man, a Thracian barbarian known as Maximinus Thrax. We start off with a quick mention of our sources, and well, they could be better. Roman emperors are usually well documented, but that's not the case here, especially the early life of Maximinus Thrax. The historian Herodian is probably the best source on the subject, since he was a contemporary. While the Historia Augusta has a detailed account of the emperor's life, but let's just say that it is prone to hyperbole, and that's being generous. A more accurate description would be to say that it simply makes up. Maximinus Thrax was born circa 173 AD in a small village somewhere in Thrace, hence his moniker Thrax, or the Thracian. He was of low birth, that we can say for sure. That's why he was often referred to as a barbarian. But who exactly his parents were is another matter. Herodian only describes Thrax as a half-barbarian who worked as a shepherd as a boy, while the Historia Augusta claims that his father was a goth named Mika, and his mother was an Alan named Ababa. But that Thrax himself concealed this fact once he became emperor to downplay his barbarian origins, also adopting the more Roman named of Gaius Julius Verus Maximinus. Thrax was a mountain of a man, and his feats of strength would put Andre the Giant to shame. Undoubtedly, most of these tales have been exaggerated, especially since they come from the Historia Augusta, but we can say with a fairly high degree of confidence that Maximinus Thrax was the largest Roman emperor in history. It is said that he was over eight feet tall, that he was strong enough to crumble stone and spit saplings and that he could wear his wife's bracelet as a ring on his thumb. But besides his Herculean strength, Thrax was also said to be courageous and, and I quote, handsome in a manly way. Although he was a bit rough around the edges in terms of manners and had a fierce temper. Unsurprisingly, a man of his size made a fine addition to the military, enlisting sometime around 190 AD and first serving in the cavalry under Emperor Septimus Severus, the founder of the Severan dynasty. As the story goes, Thrax first came to the attention of the Emperor while the latter was staging military games to celebrate the birthday of his son and future Emperor, Geta. Wrestling was one of the events at the games and silver prizes such as collars and arm rings were up for grabs. Thrax wanted to take part, no real shocker there, and Severus, once he saw his size, was also eager to see him inside the squared circle. However, since Thrax wasn't a military man at that point, the Emperor considered it improper to have a civilian, and a Thracian, one at that who barely spoke Latin, wallop his highly trained, disciplined soldiers for everyone to see. So instead, Severus booked Thrax in a gauntlet match against sutlers, i.e. civilian prisoners for the army. The Thracian went through 16 of them in one go and collected 16 prizes. At that point, Severus did his best status quo impression and informed Maximus Thrax that he was in the army now. This meant that the next day Thrax could fight soldiers, but before that, the Emperor decided to test his speed as well and had him race against his horse. After several laps, Severus went up to Maximus and asked, What say you, my little Thracian? Would you like to wrestle now after your running? To which Thrax replied, as you please, Emperor. 
At that point, Severus ordered his biggest and bravest soldiers to match up against Thrax, but it was a complete slobber knocker. The Thracian bested seven of them in one go this time, proving definitively that he was the cream of the crop. Once again, he won seven silver prizes, one for each victory, but Emperor Severus wanted to give him a reward to match his accomplishment, so he presented Thrax with a golden collar. It wasn't quite the big gold belt, but it was the next best thing. Severus was sufficiently impressed with Thrax to make him a palace bodyguard. His strength and bravery made him popular with the other soldiers. So the Thracian had no problem advancing through the ranks even at a young age. This continued under Severus's successors, his sons, Caracalla and Gieta, and Thrax was awarded multiple military honors, although we don't know specifics. This stopped in 217 AD when the Praetorian Prefect Marcinus plotted Caracalla's assassination and claimed the throne for himself. Out of loyalty to the Severan dynasty, Thrax wanted nothing to do with this usurper, so instead, he left the army and went to Thrace to live on his estate. Unfortunately for him, Macrinus was only emperor for a year before he was killed too, and the Severan dynasty was restored as Elagabalus came to the throne. Thrax returned to Rome, eager to rejoin the ranks of the Roman army, only to discover that Elagabalus was a ruler more concerned with his hedonistic desires and outlandish antics than anything to do with the military. Once again, Thrax intended to go into early retirement, but was eventually persuaded to stick around by some of the emperor's advisors. During the reign of Elagabalus, Thrax was made a tribune, even though he usually tried to steer clear from the emperor as much as possible. Fortunately for him, Elagabalus was not around for long either, less than four years, and he too was replaced by the 14-year-old Severus Alexander. There were a whole bunch of conspiracies, betrayals, and assassinations going on at this time, but since since we will likely do bios on Elagabalus and Severus Alexander in the future, we'll save the juicy bits for those videos. Anyway, unlike his predecessors, Alexander was glad to have Thrax in his service and immediately put him in charge of the Italian 4th Legion made solely out of new recruits, giving him the task of training and molding them into fearless warriors such as himself. Despite his young age, Severus Alexander actually had quite a lengthy and prosperous reign of 13 years, and during that time Thrax did such a good job of getting his men into fighting shape that the Emperor decided to put the Thracian in command of training the entire army. This was a decision that Alexander would live to regret, but not for long, because this made Thrax incredibly popular with the soldiers, whereas the young Severus was often still regarded as a mere boy playing emperor. This wasn't helped by the fact that many saw Alexander's mother as the one really calling the shots. By 235 AD, they had had enough of Severus Alexander. We're not sure what the final straw was. Usually it's claimed that it's because he wanted to bribe the Germanic tribes to keep the peace instead of fighting them, and the army saw this as a sign of weakness and felt it was time for a change. They needed someone new in charge, a real man's man, someone like Maximinus Thrax. Alexander's end came in March 235 AD, somewhere near the modern German city of Mainz. He was meeting with his generals, but unbeknownst to him, Thrax's soldiers had proclaimed him emperor and were on their way to kill him. To give the Thracian credit, Herodian claims that he accepted the title begrudgingly. As he got out of his tent that day for training, his men surrounded him and robed him in the imperial purple. At first, Thrax refused and threw down the robe. But then his men threatened him, too, so he probably thought, better Alexander than me. Severus found out about the treachery in time to rally his troops, but they weren't exactly eager to sacrifice themselves for the Emperor. They had their own issues with Alexander, so when Thrax's soldiers urged them to join their side, some of them agreed, while others simply left the field of battle. A few centurions then entered the royal quarters and killed Severus Alexander, his mother, and his friends who had been unlucky enough to join him on this trip and with his death ended the Severan dynasty. After that, all that was left was for the Senate to confirm Maximinus Thrax as Augustus. They didn't like the idea of a lowly Thracian outside the Roman upper classes becoming emperor, but they didn't really have a choice unless they wanted to end up like Severus Alexander. 
To be fair, it seems that they had good reason to be afraid. As soon as Thrax took to the throne, he began ruling with a bloody iron fist, putting to death many who were still loyal to Alexander or who had offended him back when he was a common barbarian. He would not allow anyone of noble birth in his inner circle or even the palace for that matter. Clearly the whole barbarian thing was a sore subject for him and anyone who reminded him of it risked a date with the executioner. Early in his reign, Thrax uncovered an assassination plot orchestrated by a nobleman named Magnus, and although he had everyone involved put to death, it only made him more paranoid and bloodthirsty. Then there was a second conspiracy, this time by a group of Osroene archers loyal to Alexander who intended to kill Maximinus and install their leader, Quartinus, as emperor. However, they were sabotaged from the inside as one of the archers named Macedo decided to expose the plot, kill Quartinus, and bring his head to Thrax to gain favor. The Emperor rewarded him with a swift execution because Thrax had reached the level of murderous maniac in record time that would make guys even like Commodus and Caligula a little jealous. Or how the Historia Augusta put it, never was there a more savage animal on earth than this man who staked everything on his own strength. It seemed that Thrax's strategy was to treat all the administrative matters of the Empire like he would the military, the only type of life he was truly comfortable with. He thought that he could kill all the noblemen and oppress all the common people he wanted as long as he kept his soldiers happy. Therefore, he often granted them plenty of riches, but to maintain their respect, he would also need to show them military glory. To that end, Maximinus Thrax launched a campaign in Germany to protect Rome's borders, and to show his men that he was not a coward like Severus Alexander. He started out with a war against the Alamans, and the two sides had a very deadly battle in a swamp somewhere across the Rhine, which Thrax won despite sustaining heavy casualties. Herodian describes the scene. When the Germans rushed into a vast swamp in an effort to escape, and the Romans hesitated to leap in after them in pursuit, Maximinus plunged into the march, though the water was deeper than his horse's belly. There he cut down the barbarians who opposed him. Then the rest of the army, ashamed to betray their emperor who was doing their fighting for them, took courage and leaped into the marsh behind him. A large number of men fell on both sides, but while many Romans were killed, virtually the entire barbarian force was annihilated, and the emperor was the foremost man on the field. The swamp pool was choked with bodies, and the marsh ran red with blood. This land battle had all the appearances of a naval encounter. It is probable that Thrax had been waiting for a solid victory before adopting the additional title of Germanicus Maximus and proclaiming his own son Maximus as Caesar or Kaiser, aka Junior Emperor. After the battle, Thrax traveled to Pannonia, intending to spend the winter at Sirmium and take on the Sarmatians next. However, it seemed that the people of the Roman Empire had had enough of the rule of this bloodthirsty tyrant. Thrax had been emperor for less than three years, but it was once again time for a change. But who would be the man to challenge him? Well, in this case, it wasn't just one or two or even three, but five new contenders who vied for the throne. What followed next was one of, if not the most chaotic year in the history of the Roman Empire, the so-called Year of the Six Emperors. You can probably guess why it was called that. And in case you're keeping score at home, the Empire already had the Year of the Four Emperors, which we covered in our Vespasian bio, and the Year of the Five Emperors, which has its own video, so you can give those a watch if you want to see the prequels first before we finish our little trilogy. So anyway, the year in question was 238 AD. Thrax was still in Pannonia pursuing military glory when a revolt broke out in the Roman province of Africa. It seemed that the procurator there was a man after the emperor's own heart, and the people were fed up with all of the extortions and abuses that he regularly committed to win Thrax's favor. An angry mob descended upon him and killed him and his bodyguards. Now that the deed was done, they might as well stage a full-blown rebellion and even enlisted the aid of the African governor and proclaimed him the new emperor. 
The governor was a guy named Gaudian, who we are going to call Gaudian the first from the beginning to make it less confusing. Just like Maximinus Thrax behaved at first, Gaudian was initially reticent to don the purple mantle and proclaim himself emperor. The mob had to threaten him and his family in order to get him to comply, but eventually, Gaudian concluded that he was the right guy for the job. After all, he held no love for Thrax. But there was one condition, though. Gaudian I was quite old. Ancient sources say he was 80 when this happened. So he accepted, as long as his son Gaudian II would be made co-emperor. Once this was settled, the two Gaudians traveled to Carthage with an imperial retinue to let the people know what's what. At the same time, he sent letters to the Senate, the Praetorian Guard, and the people of Rome announcing his intention to come to the capital and claim the throne. He promised to undo the evils done by Thrax. He would return confiscated property, he would provide new trials to the unjustly condemned, and he would banish the emperor's informers. To the Praetorian Guard, he promised them more money than they ever made before. As you might expect, the people were happy to be rid of the tyrannical reign of Maximinus Thrax, but even happier were the senators. They immediately proclaimed the two upstarts as Augusti, and even declared Thrax and his son enemies of the country. Clearly, they were going all in on the Gaudians. Besides letters, Gaudian also sent a few trusted men to carry out some special assignments for him. And by that, we mean assassinations. Gaudian might have tried to paint himself as some feeble old man who didn't want any trouble, but he definitely knew how to play the game. There were still some people loyal to Thrax and Rome in positions of power, so they would have to be dealt with. Of particular concern was the Praetorian Prefect, Vitalianus, who could have swayed the Praetorian Guard to stay on Thrax's side, so he had to go. He was killed by a few assassins pretending to deliver a message, and it really doesn't say much for Thrax's reputation that Vitalianus's companions initially assumed that the Emperor had ordered his death, because it was just the sort of thing he would do even to those supposedly closest to him. The prefect's murder caused a riot to break out in Rome, with some people incorrectly assuming that Maximinus Thrax had also been assassinated. An angry mob started killing judges, informers, and all sorts of officials who had carried out the emperor's cruel instructions. Plenty of innocent people were slaughtered as well, as some saw this as the perfect opportunity to deal with anyone they had any sort of grievances with, while others simply went from house to house, robbing and killing the occupants. Basically, Rome turned into the purge for a while. But once things started to settle, most of those who were still alive supported Gaudian's ascent to the throne. Meanwhile, the Senate began sending embassies to the various provinces to gain their support for the two new emperors, making it clear that this was the will of the Roman people. Obviously, word eventually reached Maximinus Thrax, and he tried to play it cool, like this was just a minor problem caused by some Carthaginians, who had taken leave of their senses. He called Gaudian a miserable old man doddering in advanced senility, and mocked the idea that his mighty, highly skilled army could be beaten by men who have no arms except the spears they use in single combat with animals. Still, he couldn't just ignore it, so Thrax rallied his soldiers and prepared to march on Rome. Now if this was a movie, then the underdogs armed with spears and led by a senile old man would probably win the day and then celebrate with a big party montage. But this is real life. And the reality was that Gaudian and his army never even made it out of Africa. Thrax didn't even need to get his hands bloody. Somebody else did it for him. It was the governor of the province of Numidia, a guy called Capilianus, who was not only loyal to Thrax, but also hated the Gaudians. For him, the rebellion was the perfect opportunity to settle an old rivalry and also score some brownie points with the emperor. Capilianus had at his disposal a proper army made up of Roman veterans and barbarian mercenaries. So, when the two sides met in battle, the predictable happened. The Gaudians were crushed, as was their little revolt. Gaudian II was killed in battle. His father soon followed, because when word of the defeat reached him, the elderly Gaudian hanged himself. And thus, the mighty Gaudian dynasty came to an end after 22 days. Although not quite, because remember, this was the year of the six emperors, not three. 
With Guardians 1 and 2 dead, the Senate was in a bit of a pickle. Imagine the Ralph Wiggum, I'm in danger meme here because they knew that Thrax was on his way to Rome and he was pissed. They had backed the wrong horse. In fact, their horse never even made it out of the gate. So, what to do now, since obviously after declaring the Guardians Augusti and Thrax an enemy of the state, they could expect no leniency from the Emperor who never really liked them to begin with. The Senators decided to name two new Emperors from their own ranks, the hilariously named Pupianus and Balbinus. They were banking on the fact that most people still hated Thrax enough that they would side with anyone who went against him. But this wasn't entirely the case because a separate faction sprang up that instead wanted to elect as Emperor Gaudian III, the 13-year-old grandson of Guardian Number Uno. Once again, the streets of Rome were filled with riots, fires, and bloodshed. With their grip on power already slipping, Pupianus and Balbinus compromised and named Gaudian Caesar, or Kaiser, which appeased the angry crowds. With this matter resolved for the time being, they still had an angry Maximinus Thrax to deal with. While Balbinus stayed in the capital, Pupianus led the campaign against Thrax, but once again, the ending was a bit anticlimactic. While Pupianus was rallying troops in the province of Ravenna, Thrax and his army were crossing the empire unimpeded, although they were hurting for food. They hoped that they could resupply in the city of Aquileia, but surprise, surprise, the city shut its gates to them, leaving Thrax with no choice but to lay siege. This proved to be more difficult than anticipated. No amount of threats, promises, and negotiations persuaded the Aquileans to open their doors to him. This was mostly thanks to a senator named Crispinus, who rallied the city to stand up to Thrax's tyranny. They had plenty of supplies while Thrax's army was starving. The Emperor's soldiers were exhausted, demoralized, and miserable. Their loyalty was beginning to waver, especially as they kept hearing rumors that all of Rome had banded together against Thrax. Ultimately, they decided that they didn't like him that much either. So, one day, either in May or June, while Thrax was resting in his tent, a group of soldiers assassinated him, then proceeded to kill his son, his commanding general, and all members of his entourage. And thus, the savage rule of Maximinus Thrax had ended. And later that same year, Pupianus and Balbinus, who had never been that popular to begin with, were also assassinated by the Praetorian Guard, leaving Gaudian III to emerge as the sole ruler from the year of the Six Emperors. Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed this video, found it entertaining and educational. I'm sure many of you laughed at the name Pupianus. I know I did. A lot. And if you did dig this video, be sure to do all that algorithmic jazz. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy.